Okay. So hello, everybody. I am not actually Jan Philipp first. I am actually Dario Eikhoff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no worries. Um, and I'm going to talk about estimating meteor trajectories um, using seismic data and why it makes sense to do so, actually. Um, please keep in mind that me and my colleagues listed here are actually geophysicists and very new to this research area. And uh, yeah, we are looking forward to any hints and pointers you might have for us. So, yeah, looking forward to that. Um, I want to yeah, especially highlight one of my colleagues here, Mosen Kushesh, because he was the first one to find uh, these strange signals um, on our network in Western Germany. And yeah, I also want to thank the Vector Stiftung for funding this research, of course. Um, so normally, we as geophysicists, we investigate processes and process the properties of Earth. And the first subdivision of geophysics is seismology, where we do this investigation uh, with seismic waves. Uh, normally, we have some point source for example, an earthquake um, from which uh, these waves travel to our seismometers, which are placed all around the globe. Um, these matter usually in three components, one vertical one and two horizontal one. And you should really keep this in mind because it will be important in the second talk. And yeah, we use these to determine uh, source locations and also the source times. Uh, but now we want to shift actually our sources from inside of Earth to inside the uh, Earth's atmosphere. So. But you might want to ask yourself, why Why would you even do this? Why would you use seismic data for meteor detection? And there are actually a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first one being that there are hundreds of permanent seismometer stations all around the globe. Here on the map on the right, you can see every permanent seismometer station in Europe. And these are not going away. These are only becoming more and more stations over time. And most of these are actually suitable for meteor detection. So it would be a shame to not use them, basically. Um, the second reason is that we can close some temporal and also spatial gap of the answer methods, of course, because we are not bound to daytime or to, to weather or something else. We can measure every day, all day. And the third reason is um, that the acoustic waves produced by meteors actually dissipate very slowly. So we can also use this method if our station distances are large and our network is not very well yeah, covered. So what kind of signals can we actually detect from a meteor? And I, I also want to, I only want to talk about the, the first uh, mechanic here because it's the most important um, in the in the following talk. And it's the Mach cone, which is uh, yeah, produced by the supersonic flight of the meteor through the atmosphere, as probably everyone knows here. And, and this is an acoustic wave, which is a, a planar wave in the far field. And these we can measure at our seismometer stations, and we can also measure, measure the acoustic wave which couple into the ground and induce seismic wave there. So let's look at our actual study area here. We are located in Germany, in Western Germany, and there was a very big meteor event on the November 14th of 2017 at roughly 1647 UTC. And this one was seen by over 2,000 witnesses, and uh, the IMO of course, generated a trajectory based on these witness reports. And we, we used this trajectory as a yeah, first guess for our initial search area where we looked at the seismic recordings in more detail. Um, so this is what we've done. We, we looked, looked for strange signals. Um, these are mostly W-shaped, like I marked here in red. And um, this is because the, the Earth is essentially pushed down by the initial pressure wave of, of the Mach cone or the Mach wave, actually. And you can see this nice W, which is very distinct and very different from normal seismic um, yeah, measurements. And this station here is actually located very close to the trajectory, again in blue. And yeah, we also have some more elastic rebounds after that, but I won't go into detail that. Um, OK, we had some signal at 228 stations. But unfortunately, we had to reduce the, like, the usable amount of stations to only 42, which is really sad, actually. But um, we're going to improve on this method uh, in the future because the method we use right now is a little bit limited in uh, many regards, actually. Um, but for us right now, most important is the beginning of the W signal in uh, where we can yeah, pinpoint the arrival of the wave. And to show some more data, a little bit of a busy plot, I know. Um, but on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is the distance to the IMO trajectory. And the red dots are 
the arrival times of the wave and every horizontal line is a seismometer recording of a different station, of course. And if uh, the IMO was perfect and the trajectory is both perfect already, then this would align to a nice, perfect diagonal. But uh, obviously it doesn't. So this tells me that uh, yeah, it's actually not fitting our data very well. So we, we try to calculate our own trajectory, of course, with a method by Puyol developed in 2005. Um, I want to make it short here. Um, we basically have these six parameters in the bracket in green, like the velocity of the meteor V, the uh, azimuth phi, the inclination theta, and some intersection point and intersection time um, with the ground. So we did um, some inversion by singular value decomposition and um, after roughly 300 iterations, we arrive at a solution. And on the right, you can see uh, the trajectory in red and our stations are now triangles and not circles anymore. Um, and they're colored in the arrival time. So you can see that we could trace the trajectory really well. And we have a, a residual error of arrival times of only 0 0.8 seconds, which we are really happy with actually. And yeah, the big problem is actually this one here. We have a velocity uncertainty of 10 kilometers in both directions. So we can't really say anything about the velocity right now. But of course, we want to do that. So we have to think about some stuff to, to constrain this. And this is, where, this is where you come into play, actually, all you guys. And you might help me with, with this. Um, the, other, the other parameters are actually all very well um, constrained. And we are really we are happy with that. And we try to also. Um, compare these results with some other um, trajectories. Um, in blue, again, is the IMO trajectory, which is a little bit southward. And in green is the trajectory calculated by uh, Pavel Spurny in also 2018, a little bit after the meteor came down, of course. And you can see that the green and the red trajectory actually, they fit really well with each other. And yeah, this gives us um, great confidence that um, our results actually, um, yeah, more or less true. Um, yeah, to, to actually conclude, I was really fast somehow. Uh, um, our seismometer station coverage of the November 2017 uh, meteor is one of the best to date for seismic stations. Um, for now, we can only use 42 of 228 stations, um, which we are going to improve. And Jan Philip will tell you a little bit more about that. And we can say safely that the SOC mechanism was a Mach cone and not, a, not an explosion of fragmentation event in the atmosphere, which is, um, yeah, really nice and also really peculiar because it was kind of a big meteor. Um, yeah, I will just leave this outlook slide here and I will gladly answer any questions in the, in the remaining time that you might have. So thank you for listening.